All right, welcome to the Language of Excellence podcast. My name is Nick Niver. I'm your host today, and today is going to be a great show. Uh, the Language of the, the Language of Excellence podcast is where we teach business owners, salespeople, entrepreneurs the power of consuming new information, taking action on that information to produce the results they desire. Today's guest is Anthony Anarino. I'm super excited to have him on the show here today. Uh, before we bring him on, what I want to do is I want to give you a little bit more of background on Anthony. If you've never heard of him, uh, if you haven't read any of his books or even have subscribed to his to his weekly article or his daily article. So Anthony is a best-selling author, an internationally recognized speaker on sales, success, personal development, leadership, and entrepreneurship. Anthony's three privately held staffing firms generate annual revenues of $50 million dollars. These firms serve some of the most well-recognized brands in the United States. Anthony speaks to and provides transformational workshops to sales organizations throughout the world. His blog, which you definitely want to check out, it's the salesblog.com, is read by 60,000 people each month. And his Sunday's newsletter, which I look forward to coming out tomorrow, reaches 80,000 people. Anthony has continually been named one of the 25 most influential people in the world of, world of sales and marketing. And Anthony's books are include The Only Sales Guide You'll Ever Need, Eat Their Lunch, The Lost Art of Closing, and the newest his newest book, Elite Sales Strategy. I'm so excited to get Anthony on the show here today, learn more about his journey and help and help to learn more how he serves the marketplace that we call sales. Welcome to the show, Anthony. Oh, thanks for having me. I appreciate you inviting me on. Yes, it's great. Great to have you here. And and I've been listening. Uh, I, I I listen to the to the only sales guide you'll ever need. Like this book, it's just it's an. I feel like it's an evergreen book. If I if I read it five years ago, if I read it in fifteen years, the, the, that that book itself has made like a tremendous impact on me because it talks about not just mindset. Doesn't talk just about skill set. It talks about that and the toolkit is what is what you talk a little bit about in that book and. Um, one of the reasons I'm really, really excited to have you on, on the show here today is you can see some books here behind me. I'm a, I'm a big reader and my default mechanism for reading is typically like reading physical books, but because I spent a little bit of time on the road, I also listen to audiobooks as well. And this book that I'm talking about, the only sales guide you'll ever need. I have both the paper book and I have the audible because I, I remember the first time I direct messaged you, Anthony, it was a couple years ago. I was on a run and I was listening to that book. And as I was going through, like, cause you go through like different teaching pieces at the end of each chapter in that book. And as I was listening, some, some books are like really good to listen to, but you had so much meat in this book. I'm like, all right, I need to physically get the book so I can take notes and find out these other books that you recommend. So, so the first off, what I really want to start out with is you are a writer, <laughs> You, you serve the sales industry, but I, I guess I want to start talking a little bit about writing. Like you've been writing for several years. Uh, you, you, made a, you made a decision to write, to write an article every day. Uh, how, many, how many articles have you written, Anthony? I don't, I don't know how many. I, I know when we moved from WordPress to HubSpot, I, I think we moved over 4,500. Or, wow. or some number like that. It's close to that number. It's more than that now because we did that last July or something like that. So however many days between whenever we finish that to now, there's been another one every day since then. Wow. So how long have you been writing articles? How many since years? 12 years right now. 12 years. Okay. And, and anyone that's either watching the show right now or listening... Anthony's, uh, his, his articles aren't like 45 words. <laughs> they're, they're very well thought out. And some sales trainers, they talk like, they talk really heavily on action. They talk really heavily on strategy. And the, the articles that I get from you, Anthony, I can tell you spend a lot of time on them and you really want to deliver value to your, to your readers um, I know when I get your article or your, your email in my newsletter on Sunday in my, into my email, I know I'm going to take at least five or 10 minutes to read because you have so, there's so much meat in there that I know I can take like one or two pieces from it. 
So there's, there's so much value in that. And you can subscribe to that through the salesblog.com, correct? Right. Okay, perfect. Over well, it four. takes you five minutes to read it. It takes me one hour to write it. So yeah, wow. It, you, you can read it a lot faster than I can write it. Exactly. And, and you've been delivering it for so long. Like it's, it's one thing to like, Hey, you know what? I'm going to record videos for a year. You've been doing this for over a decade. Like there I did are... do videos for a year too. <laughs> I'm probably yes, going to you... try that again. Are you? Okay. Yeah. It's, there's... it's just, a, it's a lot of work to have a camera and set things up and mic up and do all of those things. We're writing it. All I need is my laptop and a cup of mm -hmm. coffee and I'm good to go. Yeah. And you could be anywhere, right? The, the truth is when I started writing, I didn't know what I was doing. And sometimes I would write things that were 1500 words. Mm -hmm. And then, uh, my, my mentor and the person that actually caused me to do what I do is Seth Godin and Seth writes very, very few words in, in a lot of his things. So I did that for a little while, Okay, but, uh, it didn't, it didn't feel as good to me as when I was actually exploring something in greater depth. So I write, I generally write a thousand words for everything that I do. And well, today what I wrote was 1280 words, but uh, that's because I, apparently I had a lot to say on that. <laughs> and so I, yeah. I needed a couple hundred extra words to do that. But you're, uh, you're kind to, to notice that the commitment to writing and it's, I decided I wanted to be a writer and what do writers do? They write. Mm -hmm. So you do that. So tell me a little bit about that journey. You've been doing it for a while, like, and I, I'm, I'm assuming that there's been peaks and valleys, like some days you feel really good about it. Some days, maybe not like, what does that look like over the years? Cause like now you're absolutely a thought leader in the writing space. You've written several books, you've written almost 5,000 articles. Like what is the, what's been that journey over the years? In December 28th, 2009, I sat down with my wife and I told her I was going to make a change in my life. And because that would have an impact on her life, I had to talk to her about it. That's one of the ways they stay married for 26 <laughs> years now is uh, to talk about things. So that, that, that's how it started. And I told her, I'm just going to get up early and I'm going to write because no one wants your time early in the morning. But as the day goes on, a lot of people want your time, especially when you have kids and things like that. Mm -hmm. So I started getting up at five and that worked really well for me. And uh, almost every day I know what I'm going to write. Sometimes I surprise myself and I write something that I didn't really think I was going to write, but it comes out and that's what happens. Uh, but a lot of the times, the thing that I really love, like the thing that I want to write and I want you to love it, you might go like, yeah, it's okay. <laughs> that's all right. And then the thing that I think is like, this is just a throwaway idea, but I have to write it anyway. That's the one that people are like, that one changed my life. That was so helpful for me. And I'm like, not that one, right? <laughs> yeah. Not that one. You're talking about this one that I slaved over and thought about for weeks and weeks before I wrote it. I'm like, mm -hmm. no, that one, not so much. <laughs> and, uh, and one of the things that I've learned is that uh, the people who get value for something get value from it because it's right for them right now. And, and you can't time everybody and have everybody want to write the same thing at exactly the same time. Mm -hmm. So you write it and you publish it. And then when people look for it, they find it when they need it. So that, that's been my strategy is to make sure that it's out there and it's available if somebody needs it. Because who knows? Who knows? Those, the, some of the things that I wrote in 2010 still bring as much traffic to the blog as something that I wrote recently which, which is always shocking to me. Right. What has been, you know, from 10 years ago, over 10 years ago, when you started it to today, do you have access to more tools in terms of like response and analytics? Like what is like, what is your feedback? Like you, you write a, you write a post a month later, like, do, I mean, do you obviously you, you have access to those numbers? Like how do you measure that response? I, I don't really ever look at it. Like I, I, I know I have the, I know what the numbers are, mm -hmm. but I, I don't do it for the numbers. Um, okay. it, that that's, that's not why I do it. Um, and I mean, it's helpful. Like people know who I am and they can access my books and other things that we do, but I don't, I don't ever really 
spend a lot mm-hmm. of time looking at the wow. scoreboard. Uh, okay. I, I'm more interested in playing the game than looking at the score. So I just keep playing the game and I think the score takes care of itself. Mm-hmm. If you're always trying to do the right thing, the score takes care of itself. So I don't ever spend a lot of time. You know, I, I think we put something like 80,000 people on the the newsletter just so other people would know that it might be worth looking at. <laughs> other than that, mm-hmm. the people who get it, get it. And the people that don't, they don't. And that's okay too. Right, right. So it's just you're 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 playing the game like I'm thinking I'm thinking that competitive chapter from from your first book yeah like 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 you want to like live that language of excellence like you want to compete you want to show up and you want to keep delivering right and and if you do enough of the right activities with the right attitude you're gonna get, you're gonna get a result in either either way but what it's done for you already has produced some amazing results for you. Yeah, it's been good for me. And I, I, if I had it to do over, I wish I would. The only regret I have is I didn't start sooner. Okay. Okay. So someone that is thinking about writing, because I think there's, you know, a lot of, you know, a lot of the people that, that listen to this podcast, they've, you know, they see people that put either short, you know, uh, short copy, long form copy, they got a blog, they, they have their email list. What advice would you maybe give someone to that's thinking about getting into writing? Um, is it, is there a cadence and, you know, in terms of advice or, you know, what would you tell that person that's thinking about getting into, in, into the, the, the business of writing? It's, it's just, you, you have to have something that you have to say. And there's, there's basically, I think two rules that I would say you have to try to follow. Okay. Uh, the first rule is, um, tell the truth, like just, just tell the truth. So the picture behind me is uh, Christopher Hitchens. You can't see the whole picture. But uh, Hitchens was a polemicist and a a socialist and an atheist and a hard-drinking, hard-smoking guy, but an incredible writer and an incredible thinker. Mm -hmm. And uh, he would tell you uh, the first and the second rules um, would be true for him. Tell the truth and don't be boring. And, and, and those are basically the two rules that you should follow and then write whatever comes out of you. Like if it's in there and you have something, you have a message, then, then share it because some people need that message. If it's something that's captured your attention or your interest, or you have something to say about it, say it. And there's a group of people who need it and not everybody. And mm-hmm. somebody's going to say, Nick, I hated that thing you wrote. It's completely wrong. It doesn't make any sense to me. And it's not for them and that's okay. And not everything has to be for them. Right. And, and not everything is for you or me either. You know, we have Mm -hmm. our, our preferences and things that we think are really interesting and other things that we're not so interested in. Right. So you just have to get a keyboard and I would recommend coffee and then you just start banging away on the keys. Okay. And you typically get up at the same time every day and you're just, that's, that's, that would be well, that would be your your discipline. Yeah, four a.m. Uh, that that's my preferred time to to wake up and start writing. What time do you go to bed? <laughs> Early, uh, eight thirty. Okay. Nine o'clock. Yeah, I'm asleep by nine o'clock. Okay. For you. But if you get up at four, like get up at four for about four or five days in a row and see if you're not ready for bed. Mm-hmm. You'll right. be ready for bed about seven o'clock. <laughs> Right. And then you'll, you'll learn to adjust, but it's, there's a few hours in the morning where nobody cares about you. Like I have one creature in this house that cares about me at four o'clock and that's my cat. Okay. And, and if he's now been trained that since I'm the one that feeds him, he's not my cat either, but he's, it's my responsibility to feed him for some reason. He thinks so because (laughs) he'll come into the office and he'll just growl at me until I, I feed him. So I've decided, well, I'm just going to go ahead and feed him anyway. He's interested in me. So I'll feed him in the morning, but then no one else is like, there's no one else. So you can do, I mean, between four and six o'clock, you can do anything you want because nobody wants to talk to you. Like there's nobody that needs you and uh, it gives you time for yourself. So if you want to pick up a writing practice or you want to run 10 miles, whatever, whatever you're going to do, like the morning is a really good time when other people don't need you. And then later on, 
you know, people are going to start interrupting you. They're going to start asking you for things. Your mm -hmm. children are going to Venmo you for money, like all, <laughs> all, all these things that are going to happen throughout the day. That's Your just kids my kids want money. Mine never want money. What are you talking about? <laughs> <laughs> they uh, they're expensive. These children are, but they they start you know calling you, and you're going to take your children's calls, you know, no matter what. Like so, mm -hmm. you love that when that happens. They're all out of the house, but just nobody needs you, and so you give yourself the gift of time to do the things that you want to do and the things that you care about and the things that you think are important and you get them done in the morning and then the day can't go wrong because you've already done the most important things before most people are even up. You've already had a victory before yeah. people are even thinking about getting up. Like it's really like, yes, you, you have plenty of stuff to do during the day, but you've already like won the day. Yeah. Cause you've you already accomplished first. something. And that's, and that's how I feel about running is I like, I prefer to get my runs done early in the morning. And for years and years and years, my wife would say, I would stay up late. I would get up <laughs> the, the latest uh, amount of time that it would take for me to get ready. And then as I've gotten into this running journey of running really long distances, it's around nine, uh, 50 miles. I'm mm, that's 50. a long run. Yeah. Yeah. So I've done, uh, I, I've not run that far. I've run a couple halves, but my my longest endurance event was 200 miles on a bicycle across Death Valley. So that that was kind of a long way to go. That is a long. Like I I really don't even know what that looks like on a bike. I've never. I don't think I've ever been on a bike for 20 miles. Like how long did that take? <laughs> All of the whole day. Like it it, it took uh, 14 hours or something. Okay. It was a long time. Okay. And it's a road bike. A road bike. Yeah. Road bike. Okay. That's interesting. I know some other, I had a family member. He knows I'm running. He's like, when are you going to get into triathlons? I'm like, one sport is enough for me right now. <laughs> like, let alone worry about three and tra I, I, train for three. I, I like the idea of a, a triathlon as long as you get rid of the, the running and the swimming. <laughs> <laughs> That's funny. <laughs> That's funny. So give yourself the gift of time. Give yourself the gift of time. That's really, really powerful. And I think when people wake up later than they know they should, they, they know they probably wasted that a little bit. But again, it's just a decision. The decision you made on December 20th to write an article. The decision. Hey, every, every alarm clock comes with a snooze button on it. You know, and, and when I, I think about my my grandmother who raised five kids by herself and, you know, had to, to work really hard to take care of them. Her alarm clock didn't have a snooze button on it. Like they, they were different, different at that time. Like this alarm goes off, you get up cause it's time to get up. Mm -hmm. But most people hit that little button like three times in a row. So that's 27 minutes. I don't know why they set it at nine instead of 10 minutes, but they do yeah. and they default <laughs> at nine. And so you, you give up a half hour just because you're comfortable. It's warm in bed. Yeah. It's you're nothing. battling. It's a, it's that civil war. Like, Oh, I know I should get up, but, uh, so I need nine more minutes of sleep. And then like that nine minutes doesn't do anything for you. It's not, it's not enough for you to get back into REM sleep. There's no way like you're, you're up, you're awake. You're just happen to be laying in bed. <laughs> yeah. You're just, you're just comfortable. Mm -hmm. Yeah. But so, get up in the morning. Like if you get up in the morning, I, I'm going to just tell you like a, about building your discipline. If you get up in the morning early, you don't have to get up at four o'clock in the morning. That's just, I interviewed a whole bunch of writers before I started writing. Okay. And I kept getting the advice, like get up at three 30 and I'm like three 30. That's, that's not morning. That's like the middle of night mm -hmm. <laughs> or still the middle of night really. And, and I said, why? And they're like, you're just going to have so much better results writing uh, when there's no distractions just get up as early as you can get up and so i started at five okay but then i decided four was better because i had to get even more hours in the morning and, and that works but if you can get out of bed early and whatever you're going to do if you're going to run you're going to work out you're going to pray you're going to meditate you're going to journal whatever it is that you're going to do if you get that habit like everything else gets easier for you because for some reason it's just really hard to get up early in the morning. But once mm -hmm. you get the habit, 
then other things start to just fall into place because you've already sort of committed to like, I'm the kind of person that's going to be disciplined and get up when the alarm goes off. Now, my beard is more white and yours is still has color. So there's a, right. <laughs> a, di a difference in decades that we've been on the planet and, and that that's part of it, but it's easy for me now that uh, today is Saturday that we're recording this. And because I get up at the same time every day today, I woke up at three 45 mm -hmm. uh, without there's no alarm set. I'm going to wake up at that time because I was in bed yeah. at eight 30 and asleep by mm -hmm. nine. Yeah. Thank you for sharing that. That's really, really powerful because for the people that aren't disciplined, they, they need to hear this because it's just, it's a lifestyle. And if you get that one, for some reason, the other ones come easier. Mm -hmm. Right. I don't know why that's been my experience though. A lot of other people that have done it have said the same thing. Right. Well, thank you for sharing all that information about writing. I think it's going to be really valuable. Like I'm, like I'm definitely taking some advice here, like your, your blog that you've inspired me to write at least an article once a week and just communicate some, some kind of a message because writing is like, I think one of the hardest things to do because it, it requires transparency and you're like emptying out what's in your mind and your heart and you're opening yourself up for hurt. I think like when you're writing something that's coming from your heart. Yeah. It's uh it's it's an interesting thing when you when you start writing uh it it you're thinking like you have to think and you have to organize your thoughts mm -hmm. and you have to determine what what you value and why you value it and you're doing a lot of deep work when you're doing that. So this is sort of a Jordan Peterson's like if you want to be dangerous you know read write and speak you know, and, mm -hmm. and, and that's it, read, write, and speak. And if you do those three things, you have to think all the time. Like you have to think about what it is that you believe and why you believe it. And how do you justify what you're saying and what kind of experience led you to believe that that's true? And, and why do you value this over that? And so all of that stuff's going on on you, not, not consciously like that. You're trying to get a sentence out. Mm -hmm. And in the sentence, when you look at it, you're like, that's not exactly right. I have to, I have to go and rewrite half of that sentence because it's not exactly what I was trying to say. And so you find these words and you become a better thinker because you're a writer and writing and speaking uh, definitely causes you to have to do that work that you might not do otherwise. And I've given myself 12 years, you know, to, to mostly write about sales and success and leadership. Mm -hmm. And what do I believe about it? And what do my experiences teach me? And what have I read that's useful to other people, the, the concepts that that might benefit others? And it's uh, it's a lot more going on there than just typing, even though I would describe myself as a typist most of the time. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Um, you are right. Many people don't sit down and think it's hard. They just don't think it like it's just going through the motions. And I don't know how, to, I don't know how to describe that, but people are missing out by not thinking they're missing out by not, especially reading. They're definitely missing out by reading. Like I've been reading for several years and it's fun for me to read because I'll read a book and I'll like, hmm, did, did that chapter need to be like, I'll actually have a conversation in my head with the author. Mm -hmm. That's what you're doing. So, and that's, that's fun where unfortunately most people don't pick up a book. So you have a, a clean podcast, I presume. Yes. Okay. So I won't use any bad words, but I bought a book, uh, that was, it's out of way, way out of print. Okay. And, uh, but I wanted to read it anyway. And the book showed up in it. I didn't know that it was going to have writing in it, but the original owner, was writing his commentary and he says, this sentence is complete BS. <laughs> and, like, and he's got the sentence highlighted. So he was having an, an argument with the author. With the author, yeah. And, yeah. And I, I was sort of delighted to see all of his notes about what, what he thought about what the uh, author was, was saying in the book. So 
you are having a conversation with someone. There is nothing, I, I think, better than reading for one reason. So somebody studies something for decades, mm -hmm. maybe longer, and they write down everything that they know. And for six hours and $27, you get the entire understanding of what they have spent decades working on. Yep. You get it in six hours. Like it's the best deal on earth. It's like mm -hmm. uh, is maybe a, a penny, uh, a page you're paying or something like that. It's like, it's nothing. For all and the mistakes they've made. To, to correct don't make, those don't mistakes make these ones. before you make them. Yeah, that's right. Yeah. I think of I think of John Wooden's book. It's called Wooden. I mean, he <laughs> lived to be almost 100 years. Like the wisdom from him. Pull Why your socks you? up and tie your shoes tight. Like, mm -hmm. You don't think that's important until you get blisters. Mm -hmm. And then you think it's important. And then, yeah, he would make you work on the fundamentals because the fundamentals are most of the game. Correct. Correct. Just gold. There's gold in that book right there. Oh, and yeah. they're super small chapters. They're like literally one or two page chapters, but every single page is gold. It's I, just... love, I love short chapters. <laughs> yes. Because yes. you can go to sleep if you need to. And you don't... <laughs> Like when a chapter has a 60 page chapter, you know, a book has a 60 page chapter. You're like, oh, I got to commit to this. Like, that's a long chapter to get through. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And I have the mindset where I need to get at least through a chapter. <laughs> yeah. It's just like when I read, I try to get through a chapter so then I can think about that chapter. But 60 pages, like, no, I need that's to invest awesome. a lot of time. So thank you for sharing all that information on writing, Anthony. Like that's really, really powerful. I know there's people that, that if they're not writing, I know they're getting into the habit of writing or they want to start to write and write a book. Maybe it's even like an ebook that they want to like use for their business. So you, you just recently wrote elite sales strategies. Uh, I think there was like a little bit of a hiccup in terms of uh, logistics and getting that out because of supply chain, I believe. Um, so tell us a little bit about that book. That book is based on uh, the keynote that I gave in last year's Outbound. And, uh, yeah. and normally Jeb opens the show and then I close the first day and then I open the second day and he closes the, the second day. So we switch the, the roles each day. And I had this thing that I wanted to do and I, I hadn't done it before, but I had thought everything through. I just never rehearsed it. I, I didn't actually work on a slide deck, you know, where I, I would be, I would say more fluid than I, I was. Mm -hmm. I still had to work from notes to deliver it, but I really wanted to deliver it. And I, I told everybody there, the concept may cause people to run out of the room. I don't know. I don't know what's going to happen. So I told everybody okay. it's a, a 180 slides. I think I took 60 out because I didn't think I could get through them. Mm -hmm. Not because I didn't think they were important, just that you only have so much time. That's a lot of slides. <laughs> it's a lot of slides. It's un an unbelievable number of slides. Even cut down, it's a lot of slides. Mm -hmm. And the concept is called one-up. And it's not one-upmanship, but it, it comes from that sort of thinking. So one-upmanship would be like me trying to put you down. So I go... Nick, do I remember meeting you at Columbia when I was getting my MBA in 1996? And you're like, no, I didn't go to Columbia. Yeah, I, I wasn't. There. Then that's just me trying to make you look bad in front of other people. That's not the concept. Okay, so it's it. close to that. In any conversation where there are two people, somebody is in the one up position and somebody is in the one down position. Now, this isn't about the value of the human being. It doesn't say that. The person that's one up is a really good person and the other person's not a good person. They're both good people. Okay. So there's mm -hmm. nothing about a value judgment, but if you go out into the world and you get experience helping create better results for someone. So let's say that that's what I think we don't, we do in sales. We go yeah. out and we help people get better results. And when I do it every single day, for years and years and years, I do the same thing. I help people with the same sort of problems and getting the better results that they need and moving their businesses forward. And you are sitting across from me and you buy what I sell once every seven to 10 years. Which one of us 
has the greater experience and the greater knowledge about how you might make that decision. My argument is the person that helps people make that decision every day is in the one-up position as it pertains to that decision. And the person that doesn't do it every day needs to have somebody one up transfer their information and their knowledge and their experience to that person so that that person can make the best decision. And I, I learned this um, through a couple experiences. When I was maybe 19, I was a scuba diver. I went to the Great Barrier Reef. And when I got there, they sat us down and they said, you're not allowed to scuba dive the Great Barrier Reef without bringing a marine biologist without you, with you. And I, I thought, I don't need a marine biologist. Like I got hundreds of dives. I've been in shark cages. I've done all kinds mm -hmm. of things. And then I went on uh, a scuba diving trip with a marine biologist. You should always have a marine biologist with you when you scuba dive. Like the experience, what he knew and what he could see that I couldn't see mm -hmm. was so amazing to me. As soon as we got back on the boat, I'm like, I don't even want to go scuba diving unless I have a marine biologist with me. Okay. It was so much one up and I was so much one down that I, after that, I'm like, what else don't I know? No, like I, I don't know anything about what's at the bottom of the ocean, but he found everything. And it was such a great experience. Uh, I was young then. I was not quite that young when I went to Mount Everest and I was at base camp, uh, base camp won 17,000 feet way up there i brought altitude sickness medicine to to bet with me and i was taking it and at some point i started to get really sick and the sherpa that was helping us find our way up to mount everest he said what's wrong with you and i said uh i have altitude sickness and he said well, how do you know and i said i'm tingling my face my arms my legs and, uh, and he said, you're allergic to altitude sickness medicine. And I said, I got it from my doctor. My doctor prescribed it to me. So the man I'm talking to is a Sherpa, which doesn't mean that he's a guide. It means he lives in the Himalayas. That's mm -hmm. where he lives. Yeah. So he has domain authority because he's lived in the Himalayas his whole life. He did not go to high school and he did not go to college. He did not have a medical degree. And he had uh, yak dung underneath his fingernails because that's how they insulate their house. And I was in his house and there was donkeys and chickens on the first floor and a pot belly stove with a hole in the ceiling for the smoke to go out. And I'm struck with the idea. I have to either take Dr. Zimmerman's um, counsel. He went to Ohio State. He's got a medical degree, professional doctor. Or I have to take the the advice of a man who has none of that. <laughs> and I realized at the time, Zimmerman's never been to the Himalayas. He's never no. been anywhere near the Himalayas. He doesn't know anything about this. But the Sherpa had seen a lot of people that had altitude sickness and knew what mm -hmm. to do. He right. said, throw the altitude sickness away and start walking faster. You walk too slow. And I'm like, I can't get any air in. He goes... When you start putting more effort into it, you're going to get more air and you're going to feel better. And within about 10 minutes, I felt better. <laughs> I was oxygen deprived and there was no medicine that was going to help that. Now, I tell you those stories because he's, he didn't think he was a better person than me. He wasn't mm -hmm. trying to put me down. He was trying to transfer information to help me get a better result at Mount Everest. That's what he was trying to do. So his intentions... Yeah. We're not in any way to, to be the superior human being. Although when it comes to walking up a mountain, I would suggest that he had much greater competency than I did. Mm -hmm. But the book is basically about this concept, about what's our obligation to our clients? How do we okay. make sure that we have information disparity and we correct the lack of information that they have that would help them make a better decision? And, and that's the, the structure of the book is how do you do that? I'm starting from information disparity and understanding sort of the limits of uh, an approach where you, you give people information that they don't need you to give them. Like, uh, let me tell you about my company. It's on your website. 
you're what are you you're gonna read the website to me like i don't know like you don't need to give me any information like that and then let me tell you about what we sell i knew what you sell when you called me and asked me for a meeting or i wouldn't be talking to you if i didn't already know what you sell you don't have to share with me what your solutions are i expected you to sell what you sell Mm -hmm. and you don't have to share that with me I don't need to see logos of other people's companies. Uh, That doesn't really help me. I'm trying to make the best decision for my company. So there are things that you can do that create value. And then there are things that you can do that create anti-value. Like you're, you're actually moving the other direction from value creation Mm -hmm. to something that's anti-value creation. And uh, if you get that and you understand what I said, which maybe you do, and maybe you don't, if you're listening to this, it's a, it's a it's a different kind of way of thinking about this. I think the conversation has shifted. I know it has shifted to greater insight, greater counsel, greater advice, greater recommendations about the decision that somebody needs to make, why they should make it, how they should make it, what factors they should consider, how they should weigh those so that they can get the very best result. That's your job when you're selling. You just shared a lot of information there, Anthony. Thank you for that. (laughs) There's a, there's 260 pages of that. So helping it's, it's not just about poking holes. No, that's it. So there's, I mean, there's way more to the sales process because that's, I remember that being taught to me originally, look for holes. (laughs) The, the, the legacy approach is, you know, find a problem find a gap. Mm -hmm. Well, how do you not already know what those things are? Like, again, if you sell something for years and years and years, you know, somebody said something on LinkedIn and it was something that I posted and they said, every client has a unique problem. No, they don't. They they have a lot of the same similar problems as their competitors and people in their industry. There's a bunch of systemic problems in every industry you know what the systemic problems are in their industry because you you sell to that to people all the time knowing what those what those challenges are or why would you call them like why would you call them at all if you didn't already know i believe that i can help them because they're probably struggling with this they probably are having trouble getting these results now and i can explain to them what why and what they should do and uh, i don't understand why you want to do the, the way that I would say this, Nick, is it's kind of like this. Two salespeople. One comes in and meets with a client on Tuesday. Mm-hmm. And they say, let me tell you about my company. Let me tell you about our amazing CEO, legendary guy, legendary figure. You love him. Let me show you the board of directors, picture of our building, our global footprint, who our clients are. The, the solutions that we sell. And then I'll ask you a few questions. What's keeping you up at night? Okay. So that's Tuesday, right? Mm-hmm. Thursday, same industry. Another salesperson comes in and says, Nick, let me tell you about our company. Let me tell you about our legendary CEO. Everybody loves him. It's amazing. Let me show you these awards that we won and goes through the exact same structure as the person that came in on Tuesday. And then if you went to that person who had to sit through both of those uh, presentations from a salesperson in a first meeting, and you said, what was the difference between the person that was there on Tuesday and Thursday? They would say, I think the person on Tuesday was taller and had lighter hair. (laughs) And I'm certain that the person on Thursday had a red logo. I mean, that's what they would remember from that. Because we've done this for 40 years. So you have to imagine... Every person that sat across from that person has done the same pattern over and over again. You've taught them nothing. They've gotten no new information that, that they couldn't get off of a, a website. Mm-hmm. And we wonder why, you know, 71% of, of people don't want to meet with a salesperson because they don't think it's very helpful. And, and it's because it's not helpful anymore. It was for a long time, but it's just not anymore. And so I've written four books the first one's a competency model, the mm-hmm. only sales guide. That's really a competency model that I turned into a success book. And because I don't think I could sell a competency model. Like if it was called 
a competency model for B2B salespeople. Like people will be like, I'm not reading, man. That sounds terrible. <laughs> but the only sales guide you'll ever need sounds pretty good. It wasn't my title. Uh, thankfully, the, the publisher picked a good title. Uh, the it's, a great, it's is, a great title, by the way, because like, wow, that wasn't taken. <laughs> like, <clears throat> It wasn't taken. Thankfully, we got that one. The second book is The Lost Art of Closing, and that's sort of how do you facilitate a buyer's journey? So mm -hmm. there's 10 commitments. And if you if you look at those, you can, sorry, uh, you, you can start to see the structure of a, a good sales conversation. The third one is about stealing clients away from your competitors, which, which we call a competitive displacement, eat their lunch. And I wrote that book because I, I needed to do something to sort of really show people where the consultative sell selling really is, like where it is right now. And then Elite Sales Strategies comes on the back of that one with a, a greater understanding of your obligations to provide good counsel, advice, and recommendations when you're sitting across from a client. So you, would you say they've sort of like tiered up, like almost like gotten more <laughs> more niche as you've written more books? Well, I would say the, the level of difficulty grows, which is why I wrote them in this order. I, I wrote them in this order specifically because... I, if you don't read the only sales guide, if you don't understand that there's a bunch of competencies that aren't skills, mm -hmm. like resourcefulness and initiative and discipline and caring. caring, yeah. If you miss all those, then sell, selling's hard, uh, especially if you're not buttoned up on that kind of stuff. So you mm -hmm. do those, and then you're in pretty good shape. And then the lost art of closing is how to have a number of conversations that allow you to move it forward. And I didn't think I could give people that until I gave them the first book. And then I didn't think I could give people eat their lunch until I gave them the first two books. Mm -hmm. And and now I'm willing to give them elite sales strategies because I know you could go backwards over this and catch up if you needed to. You can read right. it and it's, it'll stand on its own, but it's better if you if you have a little bit more of an understanding and would you say it takes a certain amount of maturity in the business in sales to consume elite sales strategy? I mean, could a brand new salesperson just getting into the industry get the same value that somebody that's maybe been in sales for 20 it's, years? It's harder for a new person. It's going to be harder for a new person. Uh, there's a, a secret chapter at the end with some different language choices. But right before that chapter, there is a chapter for people who are just getting into sales and what they need to do to be able to execute that. Like listen to other people talk and try mm -hmm. to steal other talk tracks and journal what you learn each day, you know, yep. speed up the acquisition of competency. So yeah, I've got uh, a, a whole chapter for people who are just getting started. Okay, great. So if someone's just getting into sales or they need a refresher on the fundamentals, the only sales guide you'll ever need, once you've mastered the me management style is what you talked about in chapter one, working on those skill, the skill set, the toolkit, and you're getting more mature in the sales. So I, I would say almost the personal philosophy towards sales and your job. Then you can start moving towards those commitments because you're not just selling a widget. It's not just a transaction. Like there's a relationship going on here yeah. and you can be like anyone else or you could differentiate yourself. And it's a little bit more of a long, long play but it's going to build way more trust. Um, and then it goes up to the consultative selling. And then eventually this, this last book that you've written, that's, that's really, really great. I think any of the people that are, that are listening to this right now, if you're having problems with accountability or not hitting your goals and just, you know, taking the back door cause you can, <laughs> this is the book you probably need. <laughs> that's a good book. Cause it's just, like I said at the beginning, like it's evergreen. This book is going to be valuable in 10 years. It's going to be valuable in 40 years because it talks about skill set, mindset. Um, and one thing I wanted to talk about here, because I have a few hundred books behind me and yours, I think, maybe besides one other author that I read, you have other authors and their books listed at the end of these chapters. Mm -hmm. That's very uncommon for an author to do. Like you're promoting them, which is very powerful because you're edifying other speakers and other authors. But a lot of authors, I don't know if they just shy away from that because they don't, they want, 
they want you know you to buy the next book what was the thought process i mean outside of you're very well learned because you've read a lot of these books you can't really recommend them unless you've read them there we go so is, is that's, that just that's half of my library uh in the, in the upstairs uh in my office but in the basement i have this this many or more i don't know thousands of books um i wrote a book on discipline you know at the beginning that that book is about discipline but other people have written about discipline and and other books were really really useful for helping shape the way that i thought about it and what I wanted to do is if somebody needs more help than what I could give them in a book, because you get 60,000 words, that's mm -hmm. what you get for your first book. You're allowed to have 60,000 words. And I thought, well, what if, what if I don't, what if what I give them doesn't help them enough? Well, I know other resources because I've read a lot of books and I could tell them, here's a list of books that if you read these books, you'll have a, a whole bunch more information about how to do this. And uh, so I just did that all the way through the whole book, because I think it's true, except for closing, because closing, like the books were so bad and they, they were just, yeah. I, yeah. I remember you like, I can't even recommend a book here. <laughs> yeah. I can't even recommend a book. I couldn't. Well, cause, cause they're all manipulation and yeah. Like I, I, I think of that and like, all right, how do you do that? Like the first word that I think of is manipulation. Like, yeah. I don't, I don't see you recommending those no. kind of books. That's just not going to happen. That's the only chapter you don't have a book recommended, I think. Yeah. And I mean, no, I think people like uh, Ziegler wrote a closing book and mm -hmm. but it, it's, it's all tactical. Yeah. You know, I'd have no idea what the doorknob close is or anything like that. You know, I just think you ask mm -hmm. people to make a commitment and you, in the law start of closing, you figure out what value they get from saying yes to that. And if you get that part, right, the trading value rule, you're in pretty good shape. They just need to understand why am I giving you more time? What do I get out of it? Right. You get to pursue a deal, but what do I get out of it? And so you have to explain how it's going to help them make a better decision and get better results over time. And if you can't explain that, then they're right to say no. Mm -hmm. They don't feel like they're going to get anything out of it. There's only one objection to a request for a meeting. I think this is going to be a waste of my time. That's the only objection. They'll say it 11 ways. Nick, mm -hmm. can you send me some information on that? That's really interesting. Can you call me back next quarter? You know, we're right in the middle of uh, the end of our quarter right now and we can't talk to you, yeah. but we're <laughs> super interested. And, you know, and they, they're going to say whatever they think will get rid of you. Like, we're super happy with our existing provider. Like, And they're very well trained. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. They know exactly <laughs> what to say to get rid of people. They know what works. <laughs> we don't have a budget right now. That one tends to work. And, uh, so you, you, you're going to hear those things. All they really said was, that doesn't sound like it's worth my time. And mm -hmm. until you solve that, it's hard to get a meeting. But it's hard to get the next meeting unless you have something like that to say, too. Right. So I wanted to edify that process of you deciding to add those authors in the book. I thought that was really, really powerful because anyone that is, whether they're new to sales or they're a veteran, you can never stop learning. Right. Right. You can always keep learning. So if someone is watching this or listening to this and you pick up his book, you will have three or four other, more books <laughs> that are going to be on order because there's an area that you probably want to work on. And, and you have to recognize that you're one down. You're, you're one down in just about everything that is known on earth. You know almost none of it. <laughs> and so what mm -hmm. you do is you... You, you try to pick up books and you try to listen to audiobooks or podcasts like this where you get some information that you didn't have before so you can be slightly less ignorant from day to day. Like you don't know what you don't know. Mm -hmm. And then you listen to somebody. Like I like uh, Andrew Huberman, the the neuroscientist from Stanford. I just listened to one of his He's podcasts. He's a great podcast the, and yeah. he delivers a lot of value in a very long time in a very long podcast, by the way, I guess that podcast could be the like two hours, mm -hmm. but it's worth it. And you get a lot of really good information and understanding that you wouldn't have if you didn't listen to it. And so you can be less one down. Like he did one, he did an interview with Matthew Walker on sleep. Uh, okay. He wrote a book called why we sleep and the two of them, I think it was over three hours. I don't know how many days it took me to listen to it. Cause I, I, I listened to a, uh, audiobooks when I'm driving and when I'm in the shower. 
right? yeah. or, or podcasts when I'm in the shower. So I listen mm-hmm. to those. It took me days and days to get through the whole thing, but it's amazing. And I knew things that I didn't know, including the simple recommendation that I think Matthew Walker made was take a hot shower before you go to bed at night. And as you start to cool down, you'll go into a deeper sleep and you'll get a much better night's sleep than you would otherwise. And I started doing that amazing, like amazing increase in my deep sleep. And I, I would not have known that if I'd not heard that because I don't know anything about sleep. Yeah. Just one tip. Just one, one and- tip. Yeah. And I feel way better when I wake up because I take a hot shower before I go to bed. That's a, mm-hmm. that's simple. And, and i when I heard it, I'm like, that can't work. <laughs> it works. <laughs> It yeah. works great. And he was saying, um, Mr. Huberman, he, he was saying that he spends like at least 24 hours preparing for his podcast. So he spends a ton of time before yeah. he brings these people on, which is great because he's. He almost- does a lot of them on his own. Like it's just him talking and teaching the whole way through. And he's really good at it. Mm hmm. And it's only been out for a little over a year. I think January of 21 was when he started so. it. So I listened to his interview from Rich Roll last week, which was like, it was probably like a two hour episode, but it was like really, really good talking about. Who are these long winded guys that talk for <laughs> hours? <laughs> if I see a two hour, two hour uh, podcast, I know it's going to be three or four days because I need to do 20, 20 minute spots here and there for me to fit it in. So, you don't listen to anything while you run? Uh, I listen to, I, I, I listen to like a, a lot of books when I run. Uh, sometimes when I did run earlier this week, it was a podcast. It's usually a book. Sometimes it's music. Yeah. A lot of times when I'm out on the trail, it's just me. I'm just like, just listening. All right. Wait for the birds to, to come into uh, Wisconsin because it's... <laughs> Eventually they'll wake up. Even birds don't want to be in Wisconsin right now. No, they don't. No, they don't. So um, you have, uh, you and Jeb have an event coming up at the end of September. September 21st, 22nd, and 23rd in Atlanta? Yeah, I think the whole event really starts on the 18th because we have a a very large virtual um, part of this. So there's a lot Mm -hmm. of stuff that starts before then. Okay. Uh, with a whole bunch of speakers delivering content virtual and and then the the event itself is live but it's also virtual too. So if if you want to watch it we have a uh, unbelievable technology. We have like back, backstage videos going on all the time. There's just all kinds of stuff going on. So there's always something on basically from I guess we'll start at 9 in the morning or something like that. Maybe go till 7 30 or 8 because we do something called uh, outbound after dark okay and uh and we get people on stage and sometimes talk to the audience and sometimes talks to each other and it's a really good time if so you, tell us so tell us about the outbound conference because a lot I, of people haven't heard of it i i was sitting in a, a conference myself uh where i was waiting to speak uh it was for a private client and the the inbound conference was being promoted and i saw the inbound conference being promoted and i thought how could there be an inbound conference and not be an outbound conference like how that can't happen right that's not Mm -hmm. right outbound matters and yeah i called jeb and i told jeb we're going to start a conference called outbound and uh we're going to do the exact opposite of what other people are talking about at this time and so we, we did that in about six weeks. We had about 400 people show up to the first one. And then we thought that was good. So we did it again. And it keeps getting bigger and bigger every year. I mean, it is like a, a rock show uh, sales conference. It's, it's not a boring conference. No one's allowed to pitch anybody anything. All we do is teach, mm-hmm. and give people the best sales content that any of us have. And, and we deliver that. And it's just such a fun environment. It's like going to a rock concert and it, okay. it's so much fun. So that's bringing out your former, you know, being, you know, having your own band. Is, yeah. is, that, is that where that motivation comes from to have that kind of theme? <laughs> I mean, it, it, it's always a show, 
you know, but yeah, I, w we make our show like we had pyrotechnics, like you've not been to a sales conference with pyrotechnics. Like, uh, so yeah, we, we treat it like it's, 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 it's like a kiss concert mixed with Cirque du Soleil or something like that. <laughs> it's a, it's a lot wow. of fun. Okay. And this is for anyone in sales, B2B, B2C. Yeah. Oh yeah. Yeah. B2B, B2C. A lot of people bring their whole teams and I mean, we have some people that bring, you know, 25, 30 people with them. They just bring okay. it and it's like a kickoff meeting for their company. So it, it's a beautiful event. So what is just look up the outbound conference for tickets? Outboundconference.com. And you want to buy tickets now before they go up. If okay. you're in the range of our voice, go get them now because they and will go this, up. The yep. And this is live. Like you're offering a virtual element out of necessity from the last couple of years. But this, were you live last year or is this the first year? Live. live? So, so you are live. So anyone listening to this, um, I was part of a sales and marketing organization for a long time. And there was monthly conferences. There was all this association. And that's what keeps people going. So a lot of people that are in sales, that have been in sales, they've been uh, conference deprived, I would say, like face to face, because so many. We did a we did out. a documentary. Uh, I don't know when we're going to have it done. We've got a lot of it already done, but we did a documentary about the whole thing because we were we were June twenty twenty one, and no conferences had come back. We were the first conference back, and uh, and we did that, and we had six hundred people there live and six hundred on virtual. Okay, and I, I think we'll probably have fifteen hundred this year. Um, they were thrilled to be in the room and we, we literally set the room up when you see it, you'll see like there's these big gaps between people in the room because we had to set it for COVID. Yeah, so we had six people, <laughs> six, six feet between the people in front of you and behind you and to each side. And I, I said to the, the people at the Georgia world Congress center, like, what if they put their seats together? And they're like, you can't do anything about that. You have to set it up this way. But if they decide to sit next to each other, you can't do anything about it. And I thought, okay. They immediately all sat right next to each other. <laughs> they wanted to be back together. We had no mm -hmm. problems at all. Everybody was very, very good. And uh, they were thrilled to be around people again. There's just something about getting around other winners, other driven, ambitious learners. There's, there's something about it. And I know there's a ton of value with it. Um, so that's exciting that you're having that. And I plan to attend in September and I want virtual is virtual and we've experienced virtual for yeah. way, too, way too long. If I'm going to get a ticket, I want to physically be there. If you watch it, then you're really going to want to come. But I, if you, if you go out to outboundconference.com and just watch the the video that we we did a little sizzle reel from uh, last year, if you watch it, you're going to want to be there. You're you're going to go like that. Looks like a really good time. You will learn, but mm -hmm. we're going to entertain you and educate you at the same time. All right. It's a lot of fun. All right. Well, thank you for sharing that. So, so we've talked about your newest book, Elite Sales Strategies. We've talked about the Outbound Conference. We spend quite a bit of time in your um, journey with writing. Um, my, my one last question, and this is something that I ask on the Language of Excellence podcast, is you are a thought leader when it comes to writing. You are a thought leader when it comes to teaching sales, success, entrepreneurship, transformational strategies from what you've been doing the last 10, 20 years in sales and writing, how would you define the language of excellence, Anthony? I would say the, the, the language of excellence is mostly around increasing your standards. I mean, that, that's what excellence really is. It's like saying, I'm not going to settle for this because that's not good enough. It has to be better than that. And excellence is, is uh, difficult. It's difficult to be excellent. And that's why there's so little of it, you know, and look in any category and you're going to see plenty of mediocre offerings. And then mm -hmm. you're going to see some things that are expensive, but they're worth it 
because somebody decided I'm going to raise the standard so high Mm -hmm. that no one will follow me here. I mean, so if you look at everybody's carrying an iPhone, why do they carry an iPhone? Because uh, they don't, they don't lower their standard in any way, shape or form ever. You know, they Mm -hmm. just don't lower the standard. The standard always gets greater. Correct. And, uh, And how you, I know my, I bought my dad a new iPhone and, uh, I told him it was it was a thousand dollars. And he said, You spent a thousand dollars on a phone? I said, No, I spent a thousand dollars on a pocket um computer for you. Like that's what it is. It's a pocket supercomputer. Yeah, it's not a flip okay. phone. <laughs> it's not a phone. Like it's a whole bunch of things. But the phone is the least of it, right? Mm-hmm. It's good that the phone works. It's not good that it keeps ringing with the unknown, which means I'm getting spammed. So sorry about that. No, that, that doesn't stop for my phone for some reason all the time. But yeah, I think the language of excellence is about how high can we raise our standard? How high mm-hmm. can we raise our standard and maintain that? Because that's what excellence is. It's it's not making people make a concession when they when they're doing the work with you. Like you make sure that they don't make any concessions. Correct. And that's what you've been doing in writing. And that's what you've been doing in sales. And that's what you've been doing writing these books is you've been increasing that standard for others, for them to follow you and, and have some of that rub off on them. <laughs> right. I hope so. Yeah. Let's hope I make that kind of an impact. Yes. Well, you have, you've made that kind of impact on me, Anthony. So I, so I appreciate that. Well, thank you. So just to close today's show, um, if you have not yet subscribed to Anthony's blog, to his, to his, to his article, go to the salesblog.com. Um, the, the salesblog.com. If you are looking for a conference, you've not been to a conference or you're just looking for a great time, but then also great information, make sure you go to outboundconference.com that the, the physical live event is September 21st, 22nd, and 23rd in Atlanta. Make sure you go to those two websites. I get Anthony's weekly, weekly email every single Sunday. And I read it every single Sunday. He's delivering value every single week. And if you're new to sales, if you've been in sales for a while, if you're a veteran, you're going to get something up from his from his materials every single week. And if you haven't picked up a book or listened to a book, he's got four of them. I would recommend starting with the only sales guide that you'll ever need because that is an amazing book. And then you can start going up to the different steps, whether you're in you know, deep B2B where there's like a, a, a very long sales process, those later books are probably going to help. But if you don't have the me management down, you want to start with that, that book. That's, this is the book here. I'll show this again, just for anyone watching that, watch this on video, the only sales guide you'll ever need. So Anthony, thank you so much for joining us today. Any, any other words of wisdom to the salespeople that are listening to this today? Uh, same thing. I always say, do good work. Just go do good work. Thanks for having me, Nick. Thank you, Anthony. You have a great day. You too.